good Resurrection Sunday morning um, to you. And as uh, fitting, yes, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord every Sunday morning. Um, for this is the day the Lord has risen. It was on the first day of the week. Yet there is something very fitting also about celebrating once a year um, the, the, the reality that Christ is risen on Resurrection Sunday morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to John, the 11th chapter. John 11 will focus mainly on 17 through 27 together. Last week we discovered, we discovered the, from the Bible where um, why Jesus came here to earth. Why did He come? God in human flesh. He came to live a perfect life that we could not live. He died a death as a, um, a perfect sacrifice to forgive sinners and, and bring them all the way home to God. Much like the celebrated prodigal son who was welcomed home as a restored son in his father's house. Jesus came to earth to save sinners. But why did Jesus rise from the dead? That is our focus this morning. And what's the purpose? What's the hope of promise for believers in the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth? Why put your hope, banking your life and death, on the claim that Jesus rose from the dead? If you found your place in uh, your copy of God's Word, John 11, starting at verse 17, I will read. This is the Holy Word of our God. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Let's pray to the Father together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. You do not leave us in ignorance and darkness to not know our God. You reveal yourself to us. And Lord, as uh, sinners we are, we would fashion gods with our hands out of wood, stone, gold. And nowadays we fashion gods with our minds. Lord, I, I am thankful that you reveal yourself. And I pray, O oh Lord, that through your word, this very word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you would open our eyes like you did with the men on the road to Emmaus, like you did with the disciples. As you showed your body, Jesus, to your disciples, and they believed. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would reveal to us Christ through your word. Stir our hearts, renew our minds. Lord, may we rejoice this very day that Christ, who took our death and our curse upon the cross, is risen. We have a true and abiding hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, open our eyes and be glorified. We ask for your mercies. We receive them all with thanksgiving and with joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in this time here in John 11, Jesus was in his uh, teaching ministry some distance away from the siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The sisters, Mary and Martha, sent a message to Jesus, simply said, Lazarus is sick. Jesus told his disciples there that this illness doesn't lead to death, and he stayed two days longer where he was. It was then that Jesus says to his disciples that Lazarus has fallen asleep, and they need to go into Judea to awake him. 
Now, Judea was a hotbed of religious leaders plotting Jesus' death, and the disciples knew it. They, they were thinking, okay, Jesus is inviting us into his death. We must go die with him. So they say these words, Teacher, if Lazarus is only asleep, he'll recover. Then Jesus had to say very plainly, He's dead. He's glad they weren't there for Lazarus' death so that they can believe. Believe? Well, believe what exactly? The disciples thought they were following Jesus to die with him in Judea. Jesus was glad to teach them good news through this, to believe that he is the resurrection and the life. They had seen Jesus heal, they heard Jesus teach, and they spent time in just day-to-day -day tasks with Jesus. He was familiar to them, but they needed to believe that he is become the resurrection and the life. And this is the very essence of the Christian faith. Not simply morals, good living, wise thoughts, comforting thoughts in times of trouble. The essence of the Christian faith is the bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. And this proves Christianity, proving God's promises of the entire Old Testament and God's faithfulness to save his people. As Jesus himself said after the resurrection, didn't I teach you this? And I was fulfilled the law, the prophets, and the Psalms speak about me, that he suffered and he died and he rose again. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Christianity is not only a bad religion. It is an awful lie. A false religion to be completely ignored. And Christians above all people, if people to be pitied, so the Apostle Paul writes to the church of Corinth. And if Jesus did rise from the dead, the claims of the Christian faith that Jesus is God, the only way to the Father, and the Bible's teachings are absolute truth to be believed. Charles Spurgeon says this, Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, I risked my whole eternity on the resurrection. The early church was severely persecuted, many slaughtered in very horrific ways. And we look back on that and think, well, that was a terrible time. But today, the persecution of Christians around the world is by far worse than anything ever seen in history. You know, we do not reject Christ, to, they do not reject Christ to save their own lives. All they have to say is, you know what, I've been living a lie. I'm just Christian because it seems good, it's good for me, it works for me. There is an inner witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a living hope, and our everlasting life in Jesus who defeated death. It is here, and the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth, this recorded truth I want us to tune our ears to. He is the resurrection and the life, and this is everything truly believed by countless throughout history and today, so much so as to have no fear in death. Trusting Jesus' resurrection is our living hope of eternal life with God. Now, if Christianity can be simply reduced to uh, morals and values and right living mixed with silly cliches that cope with a cruel world simply as an escape, then it certainly is a silly religion. And so many feel the obligation to attend church, particularly on Easter Sunday, to simply be reminded of the Christian themes and stories, but seeing it only as that, a religion of escapism, ignoring Christ the majority of their lives. And this is all about God. We can turn this Bible, well, it's about me, it's about the stories familiar to me, it's about my morals, it's about my living, it's about everything that, for me to escape from cruelty, it's for me to just have some sort of silly cliche to get through a hard day. That's all it is. And it's not about us, it's about God. And may the Lord have mercy on us every time we try to make this about us. This is a book that's true, and it's truth. It is about God's holiness. This entire event is about God's holiness. Christ punished for sinners. It's about God's justice in His holiness. And about His great love and grace for His people through Jesus Christ. 
And this message of Jesus Christ reached the first century Jews, not a handful, but by scores, tens of thousands around the Mediterranean world, beginning in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, who traded a long tradition of worship on Saturday into Sunday. Circumcised men, now baptized as Paul puts it, buried with Jesus in his death, raised to walk in newness of life. And Passover now turned into the Lord's Supper, Jesus' Lord's Supper. Long-standing traditions by the most conservative culture that the world has ever seen is radically changed by this movement that says Jesus Christ is risen. We could account for such a change. Well, it would be irrational to even the most secular of historians to claim that this is simply a cult. Some sort of uprising was a minority. Since such a large Jewish population saw Christianity simply as a fulfillment of what they had heard and followed for many, many centuries. Through trials and exile, not even under Roman rule. Even here, first century Jewish Christians are including Gentiles who quickly become the overwhelming majority population of the early church. Oh, what could account for such a change? The only answer is this. They had heard from so many eyewitnesses that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. And they believed with a passion and devotion, a worshipful adoration, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. And they believed the word of Christ. They truly believed. Now with humble hearts and ears open, let us turn to God's voice in his Bible to learn this word of Christ and believe. In John, the 11th chapter, in verse 17, it simply says, when Jesus came... So he's finally come as he's heard Mary Martha's message that Lazarus was ill, but he knew that Lazarus died. So he comes into the village, and when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. So Lazarus was well expired at this point. Liber mortis gives it a rigor mortis. And after four days, the very beginning processes of decay, the mourners had been mourning for four days. There is a great grief and a great sorrow. Even Jesus, prior to giving the resurrection command to Lazarus to come out of the tomb, wept with this family that he deeply loved. But then we turn to verses 20 through 22. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. The grieving Martha leaves the group of mourners, including her sister, and that Jesus as who is nearing the village. Jesus, if you had been here, I believe, I trust wholeheartedly, you could have saved him. She had seen him uh, heal. He has, she has seen him in his healing ministry. I, I think Martha is expressing her belief in Jesus here. At first glance, particularly in English, it may sound a bit harsh, but Martha isn't being harsh with Jesus here. I know, Jesus, if you had been here, I know and I trust your healing touch would have saved Lazarus and he would have, wouldn't have died. But she continues there. She doesn't end there. She says, I also believe this. Even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Even now, I believe you do anything, Jesus. You just ask God, and boom, God will give it to you at your word, Jesus. I believe that. Okay, so what word does Jesus speak to Martha? Your brother will rise again. Oh, says Martha. I believe that. I think there's a, a tone of sadness there. Jesus, she heard it as simply Jesus using some sort of cliche, yeah, you know, the resurrection coming at the end. So that's what she says, one day, the coming last day, I know he's going to rise again, I trust that. It's funny, she has a similar response to Jesus that the disciples did when Jesus told them Lazarus was asleep. Jesus is talking about now. When Jesus turns to his disciples 
Lazarus to sleep. They don't get it. They're like, oh, well, if he has to sleep, he'll recover. We can just continue on our earthly ministry here. It's fine. And Jesus had to very, speak very plainly. No, he's dead. Um, and so when he, she has this response, oh, I know, I know. He'll rise in the last day. And I'll just put my hope on that. And she says, like, no, I'm talking about now. Yes, death is a grim reality and a haunting darkness that grips us all. We know where we are headed. It is an enemy. But Jesus is talking about now. So we turn this to verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So, Martha, you believe that at the coming last day, with the coming promised Messiah of God, God will raise up not only Lazarus, but all of his people. Myriads and myriads, a number that cannot be counted, with new life and new bodies. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the Messiah. I am the coming last day of resurrection. I am the everlasting life promised by God. Though he die, yet shall he live. Lazarus rose from the dead by the word of Christ. Yet Lazarus rose only to die again. Jesus doesn't just say I am the resurrection. He says I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus died, yes. He made atonement, covering his people with the perfect blood to, to, to uh, absorb the wrath of God for us. Then we can see the wrath of God like the angel of death in Egypt just pass us by. Yet Jesus died and rose again to never die again. If Jesus says these eloquent words of promised power, and he speaks into Lazarus' tomb, and nothing happened, then this is the sham of a crazy man, and this is where the religion of Christianity dies. Because who says things like this? It is fascinating to me, even in a culture like today, they're so biblically illiterate that they will take Jesus to be simply a good religious guru, who's always a good man, he just says really good promising things, and he speaks morality, that this is just universal, and this is nonsense, because Jesus claims to be the resurrection and the life, that he's the only way to the Father, claiming that all other religions, including religions in his name, that aren't actually him, is completely false and a lie, that if you bake your hopes on those things, you will die and die into God's wrath for everlasting. Jesus says weird things. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm about to prove it to you. Roll away the stone and I will claim Lazarus come out. At the end of history is a coming resurrection and everlasting life. The final pen stroke recorded in human history, which is recorded in the genealogies of the Bible, but also in the obituaries today. So and so began so and so. They lived this long, they did this, they did that, they enjoyed these hobbies, they did this uh, work in their life, but then they died. They died. And that, that coming resurrection of life, Jesus says, that, that's Martha, that's me. Who says things like this? He says, I've come to secure salvation and resurrection for all of God's people, those who believe in me. And I'm seeing it goes on. I'm so happy I'm here now to display this good news to you. My upcoming death, burial, and resurrection in the resurrection power I'm about to put on display. I will prove God's salvation is in me by raising from the dead to never die again. I am the resurrection, he says. But he says, I am the life. If Jesus' power of resurrection can raise a well-expired Lazarus with a word, whose body would have been into the process of decay, far removed from the hope of reviving by even the most modern medical equipment, who would require a new creation, then Jesus truly possesses power over death and the power to give life. He truly is the resurrection and the life. Those that Jesus truly become new creations. 
given a resurrection hope that though we die, yet shall we live. And we live with him. For to live is Christ, to die is gain. And now and forever we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But he continues on, verse 26. Jesus says, And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he's saying that those who die, yet shall they live. So if you believe in me, though you die, yet shall you live. You will never die. But he asks Martha this, do you believe this? Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead as the resurrection and the life for those who believe. So that is an important question for us all. Do you believe? When someone who says profound things gains media attention, we may take their words to heart, but only for an apportion. Their words die with them. And we may be moved with, you know, momentary sentimental joy, maybe take in words to cope and put them on social media, but that is how so many take the words of Christ. There is in our culture a sense of familiarity to with Jesus of Nazareth and the stories that surround him. So many folks can, today consider themselves Christian but display zero power and zero authority of Christ as Savior and Lord in them in such a way that displays and magnifies to everybody who walks around with them. This is, oh, this is definitely the power of the resurrection and the life of Jesus Christ in them. They want a Christianity that is basically only on their terms, a salvation that's guaranteed without any change or love for Christ and his bride, the church. To so many, Jesus of Nazareth is simply a trinket that sits on a shelf in a curio cabinet. The scenes of his death, his cross, his empty tomb are just fine and detailed with an artist's brush. The trinket reminds you of Easter Sundays years ago. Maybe dinner with family. Maybe simpler times. So you hear the familiar question of Martha, do you believe? And so many would answer, oh yes, I believe Jesus. I believe his stories. They're all well-worn and familiar to me. In the simpler times of years ago, the sentimental joys I have with a trinket on the shelf that you named Jesus, yes, in this I believe. But that wasn't Martha's answer to Jesus' question, now was it? Let me see again in verse 27. Martha says to Jesus, Yes, Lord, Master, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Martha believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised King to rule in peace in the kingdom of God on David's throne forever, from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus is the Son of God. He is fully God in human flesh, reconciling sinners to God forever. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and Martha has seen His truth and glory and believed He has come into the world as John introduces His Gospel in chapter 1. There are so many who say they believe in Jesus, but do not do what he commands. They have nothing to do with his church, no display of love and obedience to his one another commands. There's no adoration and devotion to Jesus. He's simply a trinket. He's simply there for sentimental joys. And there's no care to repent and live for him. But Jesus is not a sentimental trinket, an idol of comfort. Does he is a grave conquering Christ who commands your life as the resurrection and the life. Now I know that to those who are perishing, this gospel of foolishness is an aroma of death. But to those who believe, yes, believe. Who Christ, by power and authority, said, come out of your tomb. And you have a new birth, a new creation, and a total devotion to Christ, who is your life and joy and treasure to those who believe. This word of Christ is the power unto salvation. For we know, though we die, yet shall we live. And with a word, Jesus says, roll away the stone. 
And he calls it to Lazarus' do. Lazarus, come out. Life restored to a well-expired Lazarus as a new creation. And Lazarus walked out of that too, still wrapped. John's gospel was well circulated. Many, many, many people were there. This testimony of this reached the ears of the Pharisees in the upcoming John's Gospel. Just like Jesus' own res resurrection, his opponents didn't refute the resurrection. These resurrections had many, many eyewitnesses. It would have been easy to refute it. But they all gave testimony that Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead of the Word. Jesus himself rose from the dead. So what will you do with this truth? Is Jesus' resurrection story simply a familiar yet carefully crafted trinket to you? And at the end of the service, you're more than happy to put it right back on the shelf. Or do you believe? Do you believe in Christ? Do you believe in His work? He died on the cross as a sacrifice. So when you say, I don't know if I can be forgiven. I don't know if I can be resurrected. There's nothing in my heart that's more toward God. I just want God to be real and true to help me cope with this cruel world. He rose to never die again. To be my living hope that though I die, yet shall I live. Jesus died. He rose again, proving his conquering power over death. He rose but he did not walk out of the tomb still wrapped like Lazarus. Because Lazarus would go back into his tomb. No. Jesus carefully folded his wrapping. And he walked out of that tomb to not re enter. For he is risen to never die again. So I ask you do you believe this? He said, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall they live. As a promise to bank our lives on. Do you believe in Jesus of Nazareth? So I ask you, with the very word of Christ, that you would arise, O sleeper. Dead in trespasses and sin, arise to new life by Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. He brings us home to God the Father, giving us new birth. And by the promise of his word, which raised Lazarus from the dead, though we die, yet shall we live. As if you would like to know more about believing in Jesus Christ, following him. I was saying you can, can, talk, you can contact uh, Pastor Stephen or myself. I can tell you sincerely, with everything in me, we would love to talk with you about following Jesus being baptized, becoming a member of our church family here in Allison Avenue, or if you're too far away, a biblically healthy church in your area would love to help you connect to them. You may contact our church Facebook page by messenger, comment in the section below, even list the website, or even call us at the church office and leave a message. I would tell you sincerely, we would love to talk to you and pray with you. And as we become a um, singing church, get 